Coming up on Jonathan Bird's Blue World, Jonathan meets some big lobsters. All of this today on Jonathan Bird's Blue World. Hi, I'm Jonathan Bird, and welcome to my world. The American lobster may not look all that tasty, but this large crustacean that was once considered a nuisance bycatch is now considered a delicacy around the world. Although they're shipped to restaurants everywhere, they come from the cold waters of the North Atlantic, mostly from New England and Eastern Canada. I want to find a really big lobster, so I've come to Eastport, Maine, right on the Canadian border, to hunt for a monster. Lobsters hunt at night, so they like to hide in holes in the rocks during the day. This is what you normally see of a lobster during the day, just a couple of claws sticking out of its den. With some gentle prodding, the lobster will come out to defend its turf. Lobsters are extremely territorial and often fight each other for prime dens. I have to be very careful of the claws. If this lobster gets a hold of my hand or fingers, it can easily break them. This lobster has a larger claw on the left side. This is called the crusher claw. The other claw is the pincher or ripping claw. The crusher claw tells us that this lobster is left-handed, uh, clawed. When a lobster gets this big, it demands respect. Maine is the lobster capital of the U.S. and Booth Bay Harbor is one of the most popular places to visit if you want a fresh lobster dinner. It's also the home of the Maine State Aquarium where I'm learning a little bit about the life cycle of lobsters. I'm venturing behind the scenes in the Bigelow Laboratory where they conduct research on lobsters. Researcher Amy Hayden Rodriguez introduces me to some of the unusual lobsters in their collection. Now, most lobsters are not red. That's, that's the color they are when they're cooked. In the wild, lobsters are more this color, sort of an olive color, maybe with a little bit of green and some orange. Now, every once in a while, however, you'll come across a lobster that looks like this. This blue coloration is an extremely rare pigmentation found one in every three million lobsters. And I have to say, they are cool. Now, if you want to talk about rare genetic variations, this one takes the cake. This one is called a bicolor lobster. And you can see that the color is divided right down the middle. One side's blue, the other side's kind of a pale yellow. These bicolor lobsters are so rare, only one in every hundred million of these are born this color. That is one rare lobster. This female lobster has something very special going on. If you look underneath her tail, it's full of eggs. The female incubates thousands of eggs under her tail for up to a year before they hatch. And then when it's time for them to hatch, she releases the eggs out into the water. They hatch with little larvae that swim off into the water to become planktonic lobsters. Lobsters don't grow very quickly. And just to give you an example, this is uh, about a one month old lobster, just old enough that it has settled down to the bottom after being plankton. But from this to the next phase, takes a long time. This little guy, hey, this little guy is between a year and two years old. It takes a long time for a lobster just to reach this size. 
And this is nowhere near market size yet. Incidentally, they pinch. Thank you. Now this one, this one is just barely old enough to be a legal lobster for a lobsterman to catch. And it's probably seven years old. So it takes seven years just for a lobster to be big enough to catch. So you can imagine how long it takes those really big ones to get three feet long. A few hundred years ago, lobsters were incredibly abundant. In fact, after a big storm, the beaches would be covered in lobsters washed up by the waves. Back then, lobsters were considered cheap food for poor people. How times change. Lobstermen catch lobsters using a simple trap, the design of which hasn't changed much in a hundred years. The large round opening in this trap is where the lobster enters the trap. If they're undersized, they should be able to get out this little rectangular escape hatch. Down at the dock, I see the crew of the Catch-22 sorting their haul for the market. I go down with my camera to check it out. Lobsterman Todd Plummer and his crew have told me that I can go out with them to see what a day of lobstering is like. The sternman stuffs bait bags with herring as we cruise offshore to haul some traps. The coast of Maine is ruggedly beautiful, but the inshore areas are a labyrinth of lobster buoys, each connected to one or more traps. Finally, we arrive at one of the areas where Todd has set some of his 600 traps. Todd checks each trap for keepers, that is, lobsters that are legal size, and throws back the shorts and other bycatch, like crabs. Because this is done by hand, none of the short lobsters or bycatch is harmed. His sternman bans the lobster claws so they can't attack each other in the hold. In the next trap, Todd finds a female lobster with a notch in her tail. There's a female notch right there. Let's see. Oh, let me see. Female, and you can see it's notched here. The right flipper. Let me just uh, get a close up of that. The V-notch was put here by a fellow lobsterman so that everyone will know she's a good breeder and let her go. This is how lobstermen protect the future of the industry by ensuring that there are always lots of egg-laying females out there. I want to see just what it looks like underwater when hauling traps. Oof, gotta love dry suits. I don my dry suit for a dive off Todd's boat. This water is too cold for a wetsuit. At last, I enter the water and descend to the bottom. With the assistance of a winch from above, the heavy trap takes off into the gloom. At the surface, Todd checks for keepers and then sends it back down. Inside another trap, a lobster's trying to get out through the escape hatch, but he's too big. Many times, in fact most of the time, lobsters don't even go into a trap, but walk right on by. After filming a few wandering lobsters, I decide to head back up so Todd can get some work done. Lobstering is a tough business full of hard work and long days. Todd gives me a chance to try his job for a while. All right. All right, ready? I get lucky by pulling up a female lobster with eggs. Oh, yeah. We, uh, oh, let's see. oh, this is going to be good. And it needs to be notched. And it needs to be notched. Oh, this is great. This is a great lesson right here. Okay, I got my uh, measure. Yep. Got my measure. Let's find the first one. Oh, well, this is the first one. We just go right to the egg one. Okay. Now, this one has eggs, so maybe, 
you can tell me what we do what with you need the... to do with it is if it's female it has eggs obviously it's female <laughs> you need to notch the tail legally all right hold like it this. okay hold and it yeah. hold it we gotta get a shot of this all right carry it in this. there right in now you have a notch okay i'll be able to take that lobster again okay so that's for our future right there all right so that that's going to tell every other fisherman that this is a good egg bearing female and leave her alone right all right this is safe for life now okay so. i'm i'm gonna set her free okay ready never to be eaten by people but only to lay eggs all right <laughs> off she goes my time as an apprentice lobsterman taught me how hard these guys work for a living and i also learned how efforts like v-notching have made lobstering one of the few fisheries that really makes an attempt to ensure the long-term viability of the species American lobsters are one of the more interesting things to see on a dive in New England, and they're among the largest crustaceans in the world. They're fun to play with, and when they see their reflection in the camera lens, sometimes they can get pretty territorial. As interesting as they are, though, I still don't want to eat one.